far, we have focused on whether individual differences in abilities or in learning preferences are related to individual differences in learning. And largely, we keep coming back to the importance of individual differences in prior learning. Now in this lecture, we're going to go back to the issue of motivation, but this time from an individual differences perspective, from the standpoint of interest. And that is, we're going to ask, are there individual differences in the things people find interesting? And if so, could those affect learning? And do they affect learning? Then we'll consider a personality trait that might be interpreted as general interest in learning and how that trait actually affects learning. Now, I know this may come as a shock to some of you, but in fact, there are differences among people in what they find interesting. And I hope you were sitting down when I said that. In fact, these differences in one form or another are evident very early. For example, one study of preschool children, three and four-year-old children, showed that children had clear, well-developed interests already with respect to the play materials in their preschool. The interests were really obvious and really evident, and that means you could figure it out really fast by just hanging around in the classroom which kid was interested in what. And different kids had different interests, and kids' interests stayed the same over three weeks, so it wasn't just a matter of kids randomly choosing different activities on a single day when they were observed. Rather, kids consistently went after particular activities that seemed to really interest them. Well, could these differences influence learning? It seems very, very likely that they do if you just think about your own experiences of interest. Let's consider an example or two. I'm really interested in nutrition and fitness in my non-work life. So what does that mean? Well, in part it means that some of my discretionary and leisure time gets spent involved in activities related to nutrition and fitness. I like to run. I like to lift weights. I really enjoy hiking. I enjoy biking. I swim. When the weather lets me, I cross-country ski. And I also do a lot of cooking, and I focus on healthy cooking in the cooking that I do. Now, in all of those activities, there are aspects of learning. I'm probably continuing to learn things relevant to fitness and nutrition as I do those activities. For example, with running, I'm probably fine-tuning my running skills, my posture, my balance, and my stride rate. And when I'm cooking, I'm honing my understanding of cooking techniques, my ability to do those techniques, and I'm shaping my knowledge about food combinations all the time. But the activities alone aren't the only way that my interest is contributing to further learning. I also read a lot about nutrition and fitness. I read books, I read blogs, and I read newspapers. And given limited time, say, to read the paper, I'll almost certainly check for the latest news on fitness before I check for the latest news on the Middle East peace and or fight of the day news. Now, over a few years even, what I've actually done to myself is to develop my knowledge about fitness and nutrition quite extensively and possibly at the expense of being an informed world citizen. But we're all this way. You may not be a nutrition research buff. But we all make choices about the activities we do and the topics we seek information about. And when it comes to leisure, what drives our choices is interest. So interest, because it's shaping our attention and our behavior, and over time our knowledge, ought to influence learning. But there's also a fair amount of learning that we have to do rather than want to do, right? And so in somewhat more controlled studies, we can also ask whether it's true that interest shapes learning. And it would be important to know this, because from an educational standpoint, it means that you need to devote time to making your topic interesting for people, as well as clear and understandable. Now, we did talk earlier about Sansone and Herakowitz's research about people who differ in how interested and motivated they are by social interaction. And you may remember that in that work, people who were highly motivated by social relationships and social exchanges were more motivated to learn a task when they could do it together with someone else. 
But here's the catch. We don't know if their actual learning was better. We only know that they were more interested in the topic and they asked for more information about related coursework. Those motivational factors might lead them to go on and to learn more, but the studies just don't tell us that. However, doing the right kind of research that would really answer the question turns out to be extremely labor intensive and difficult. So there are surprisingly few studies available in this area that really directly look at the relationship between individual interests and learning. And a good deal of the work that does directly test this relationship was done by Renninger and her colleagues. Why is it so difficult, you might be thinking? Well, first, to test the effects of individual interests on learning requires that researchers make similar learning materials that reflect or that relate to quite different interests. And then they have to expose each person to materials that are consonant with or congruent with his or her interests and materials that are not congruent with his or her interests. And if you don't make the materials similar, which is a big part of the work, and you find learning differences, you can't tell whether it was because people learned a different what or because the people had different interests. Even more complicated, researchers have to ensure that when they're comparing different topics or items of interest, they have to compare items that are in general possibly interesting, right? So it's not a matter of differences between toys and socks, but of differences between one kind of toy and another kind of toy, so to speak. Now in one relatively early project, the preschool children in the study above were shown pictures of their interest objects and other objects. Now the other objects actually reflected the interests of other children in the classroom. And this is a really nice strategy because that way you know it's not just that the object is fundamentally stupid or boring. It could be of interest to a kid. It just doesn't interest this kid. So the researchers then went on to look at children's eye gaze direction. And that helped evaluate where the children were focusing their attention. And they were able to show that kids were more likely to look at their interest objects than at the other objects. Then the children also showed biases in recognizing and recalling the images they were shown in other parts of the study. And again, these biases were oriented towards their individual idiosyncratic interests. So the fact that interests shift attention and result in differences in memory means that interests influence learning, at least in these three to four year old kids. Now the nice thing about studying preschoolers is that the scope of interest they might have is kind of small. The downside is we're not really that interested in kids learning lists of toys. And worse still, three to four year olds are less able to avoid learning than other age groups. They're just not in a position to not go to class or to tune out during a, a lecture. And they also have a lot of learning that happens just as they try to go about doing everyday things. They're pretty motivated learners. So where this all gets more interesting and more important is when we start to look at older kids or adults learning stuff that they have to learn, like reading comprehension or math. And when we start to ask whether tailoring the learning of those topics to individual interests could be helpful. Now, Renninger and colleagues more recently conducted some work of this sort with 11 year olds, and it looked more explicitly at learning from texts and at solving word problems in math. And this is a really important way to examine these issues because reading to learn and being able to use math to solve problems that aren't always given to you in the form of a math problem, these are really important skills kids need to acquire and adults use all the time. And you can somewhat equate the what that's being learned across kids who differ in interests in that everybody's learning reading comprehension and math skills. Now, as in the preschooler study, they initially sought to identify kids' idiosyncratic interests. And then the researchers went on to develop reading and math materials that incorporated an individual child's interests. And then they were able to test whether kids learned better from a text that concerned material in which they were already interested. What they found was that when students are allowed to work on tasks related to their individual interests, their learning is sometimes enhanced. And this is more the case for reading than for math problems. Now that said, interests also sometimes masked or hid a student's difficulties in understanding. So students were sometimes less aware that they had a gap in their understanding when the material was something in their area of interest. 
One way to think about this problem is that when we read about an area we have strong interests in, we also tend to have strong prior knowledge in that area. Um, and I'll say a little more about this later. But as a consequence, we may actually gloss over gaps in our understanding of a passage, or we might fill those gaps in with knowledge from our already acquired learning. And sometimes this is good when we have the right knowledge, but when we lack the right knowledge, it sometimes doesn't work out so well. Another way to think about this comes from a related body of work on what are called seductive details in learning from texts. Seductive details are interesting facts and trivia, funny cartoons and illustrations that aren't really important for understanding a given body of work, but they're used because they're thought to help engage a reader's attention and keep them reading. And careful studies have shown that seductive details do draw the reader's attention, but in fact, they draw the reader's attention to the wrong material. They actually divert attention from the central things that students need to be learning to the trivial details that are making the text more entertaining. Now, all of this suggests that tailoring educational materials to individual interests is something worth examining with caution, because it's pretty hard and pretty labor intensive to do it well, and it may not pay off all that well for how much kids learn. Though it may help keep kids motivated and interested, some researchers would say it helps emotional interest, but at some cost to kids' learning. Now, so far, we haven't given much attention to how differences in interest develop. And this is also important because if we could figure out how an interest begins, maybe we could figure out how to get people interested in the stuff they actually have to learn, and we could sort of circumvent this whole issue of idiosyncratic, already developed interests. So theorists have developed a model that lays out the process of interest development in a kind of linear fashion, and it goes something like this. First, people experience what's called a triggered situational interest. A triggered situational interest is a momentary experience of the emotion of interest, and it's triggered by some ongoing event. So one common experience might be to catch a news phrase on public radio, and it triggers more focused attention to the story being told. Now afterwards, people can maintain that situational interest, or they can lose it. I once heard a snatch of a story on the bacteria in our intestinal tracts on NPR, and I was really captivated by this idea. It was pretty easy to sustain my interest, even when the material became more technical. Now, to give you a different example, I also got temporarily interested in a form of exercise class called Zumba when I heard the music playing while I was running at my gym. Now, a maintained situational interest is not necessarily part of my identity yet, but it can result in repeated experiences of interest. So I have a maintained situational interest in gut bacteria. It means I read news stories on it when they show up in the Sunday Times, but I don't really pursue further information on it beyond that. After a few Zumba classes, I actually lost my interest in pursuing the activity. It felt more repetitive and it was just less interesting than I thought it would be. For something where people begin to seek out actively engagement in that activity or involvement in that topic, researchers call that an emerging individual interest. It's kind of a third stage. And an emerging individual interest means an interest that's sufficiently part of my ideas of myself, my identity, that it actually motivates my choices about situations and behaviors. Over time, individual interests can become sustained, and from my own perspective, part of someone's identity in a way that will sustain them over many years, maybe even a lifetime. Now, one of the important points here is that by the time you have a developed or a sustained individual interest, what that means is you also have some competence in that area. You have some foundational knowledge in the area. And keep that in mind as I go on to the next issue today, which is this. This descriptive notion of moving from point A, which is sort of the triggered situational interest, hey, that's kind of cool, to point D, I'm really interested in and devoted to this topic or activity, it's not that satisfying or useful. And that's because it leaves out the why and the how. How do you go from point A to point D and what affects that process? Now to answer this, one way to think about this is to actually go back to self-determination theory. And we discussed that earlier in the first lecture on motivation. And in that lecture, we primarily focused on the issue of our need to be autonomous, to control and direct our own lives, and how learning experiences that undermine autonomy have some serious costs. But self-determination theory actually proposes that there are three fundamental needs for human beings. Autonomy is one, but two others are connecting with other people and feeling competent.
So in terms of what kinds of things trigger situational interests and maintain them over time, an important precursor for an interest becoming part of our identity, it's probably not going to surprise you that self-initiation, choosing the activity yourself, perceiving yourself as talented or potentially talented at the activity, and feeling connected to other people through that activity are all part of how initial interests get triggered. In other words, activities and topics seem interesting to us initially when engaging with the topic because the activity fuels autonomy, competence, or relatedness. Now, when we take a long-term perspective and we look at how those situationally triggered interests might get sustained and turned into individually identified interests, social support turns out to matter. Social support means the role other people, and in many of these studies, the other people of interest are parents and teachers, play in fostering our interests. And social support plays out in many ways. Parents support their children's interests financially, by giving time and resources for their kids' interests, and by showing interest and enthusiasm in a child's interests. And all of these show someone that their emerging interest is valued, and they allow them to increase their competence within the interest area. Teachers who provide clear structure and monitoring also help students develop interests. And if you think about it, structure and monitoring are ways to help students acquire competence. And monitoring, in particular, communicates the value of competence. And in fact, one nice project followed preschoolers over time to see which preschoolers maintained their individual interests and which preschoolers didn't. And it turned out that the kids who maintained their interest had parents who believed in supporting kids' curiosity, provided more materials related to their kids' interest in the home, and more frequently read their child nonfiction books about the interest area. But here is the big story in this area. Longitudinal studies of students' interests in academic settings point to self-perceived competence as a major foundation for the development and maintenance and enhancement of individual interest over time. What this means concretely is that interests are relevant to students' course selections in the beginning of an academic period. But over time, it's their achievement, it's their actual competence or actual learning in the courses that really predicts future interest. And their achievement, their competence, predicts future interest better than their initial interest in a topic. So interests matter, but they matter more in terms of how they catalyze expertise the way individual interests play out long term is by fostering initial learning. And it's initial learning that catalyzes greater interest and greater subsequent learning. And competence itself is fundamental to interests. We like and we're interested in the things that we feel good at. So this really brings home another valuable aspect of prior knowledge. Thus far, we've emphasized prior knowledge as making learning easier because it changes in coding. And coding things is easier when you can more easily make connections between new stuff and what you already know. But prior knowledge can also make it feel more interesting to learn something, perhaps because the learning experience is better at feeding your need for competence. Now, before we leave the topic of interests and individual differences, there's also a general, broader individual difference in personality that we need to consider. Researchers in personality have arrived at a consensus that personality is best described in five or six broad dimensions. And many of these dimensions are not important for us to, th to think about today. But one of them, in my view, is central to the idea of individual differences in interest. And that's the dimension of openness to experience. People vary in the extent to which they are high or low in openness to experience. So what does it mean to be high or low on this trait? Those who are high on this trait like novelty. They find aesthetic experiences like looking at art and architecture to be interesting. They enjoy reading and learning new things. And they enjoy thinking about the meanings of their experiences. So this is a trait that captures a general orientation towards intellectual, learning, creative, and aesthetic pursuits. And people do vary on this dimension. Some people want to do more exploring and thinking and learning, and other people are somewhat less interested in doing so. So you can think of this as a difference in interest in learning broadly. Like other personality traits, openness to experience is largely stable after early adulthood, by about age 30 or so. It's also something that we and our friends and our family generally agree on. And by that I mean if I describe myself as high in openness to experience, my husband will likely agree and my friends will likely agree.
And in point of fact, the audience for this lecture is likely to score higher in openness than a general population sample because buying great courses is the kind of thing people high on openness do. Now being high on openness to experience appears to have some important advantages for people in terms of being able to experience lots of feelings without suppressing them or distancing from them. And it seems to have some real advantages for how people deal with stressful experiences. But what about learning? Is openness to experience linked to better learning? Well, this could be the case in at least two different ways. So one way is that openness could work indirectly. It could work because it motivates people to pursue more learning, because it is an individual difference in interest in learning. And as with interests, as I mentioned earlier, small differences in interests can lead to larger differences in acquired knowledge, which in turn lead to larger and larger differences in subsequent learning. And likewise, openness could motivate seeking further education, which in turn increases learning. Now, openness might also work directly. It might work by changing the way people engage with a learning experience. There are a few studies that can be looked at to evaluate these ideas. Now, some studies actually examine relationships between openness to experience and various kinds of cognitive performance tests. And these include tests of general knowledge. So we can think of these as being indirect evidence for the idea that openness to experience fosters seeking out more learning opportunities, which in turn fosters the acquisition of more knowledge. As we discussed in the lecture on IQ, these kinds of tests suggest a history of learning in various areas. Now, in a very large longitudinal study of Swedish people, those higher on openness to experience scored higher on an entire array of cognitive tests, including many tests indicating acquired knowledge, like verbal ability tests. It was true for men and women. And importantly, this was true even when researchers statistically controlled for people's level of education. Now, that's important because openness to experience might just be linked to the pursuit of more education. And remember, we discussed the strong possibility that differences in IQ type performances might simply reflect more education. In a second study, researchers looked at university students and they assessed their openness to experience as well as their general knowledge. And to measure general knowledge, they looked at a questionnaire that assesses knowledge of literature, general science, games, fashion, and finance. So a pretty broad assessment. Openness to experience was linked to higher general knowledge and across many studies, openness to experience is consistently connected to knowledge-based aspects of IQ test performance. But this is all somewhat unsatisfying as a test of whether openness differences influence learning, because for that, we'd like to see a more controlled approach where people who differ in openness to experience all try to learn the same material under the same circumstances. And for that kind of study, I'd like to tell you about a different project. And in this project, researchers looked at a pilot training program. And the pilot training program was interesting for several reasons. So first, it had two stages. And that lets researchers look at how a trait like openness predicts the transfer of initial learning in phase one to a phase two part of learning that has different demands. The second thing this does is that it standardizes what people have to learn. They have to learn how to pilot an aircraft. And the last thing that's really great about this is that it, this is a kind of learning that isn't stereotypically intellectual. It, in, rather, it involves visual, spatial, and motor skills. So it makes for a little bit of a more demanding test. Now, 85 participants, and almost all of them were men, came to the flight academy, and they wanted to earn a private pilot's license. And they began as true novices. They had little to no flight experience prior to beginning the program. The training program's first phase is a computer-based flight simulation program that has a series of lessons. And in these lessons, trainees have to execute simple maneuvers. They have to climb, descend, and turn their aircraft. And they have to do so within some constraints. That is, they have to hit good enough performance before they're allowed to go on to the next lesson. And they have to complete all of the computer-based lessons successfully before they get to go on to phase two of training. And for this computer-based phase, the researchers looked at how many tries people needed to pass each lesson. And they used that as a measure of how effectively they were learning. Now, the second phase of training involves actual cockpit training with a flight instructor. And it culminates in a test flight that, if you do it successfully, certifies you to get a private pilot's license. So as you can see, both phases of training involve similar actions. 
they involve those actions under very different circumstances, and there are different levels of seriousness or risk. In phase two, things are higher stakes. Now for the second phase, researchers looked at how many hours it took before people got their private pilot's license as an indicator of successful learning. Now before people began the program, they reported on their personality, and they specifically reported on openness to experience, and also a couple other traits, emotional stability and conscientiousness. And these latter traits haven't been widely linked to learning, but they do reflect the extent to which people are likely to experience negative emotion, and the extent to which people are reliable and follow through on promises and so on. And so they might be related to how well people do in the training. So first off, there were no personality traits that predicted performance in phase one learning. So for phase one learning, that computer-based learning, openness, emotional stability, and conscientiousness were all irrelevant to how well people performed and how quickly they mastered that phase. The real action was in phase two learning. For phase two learning, one major predictor of how people did, how many hours they needed to get their private pilot's license was, not surprisingly, phase one learning. But personality also mattered. The higher someone's openness to experience, the more quickly they learned in phase two. So there is some evidence that being more open to experience fosters general learning and is linked to better ability to transfer learning from one context, a computer simulator, to another. Openness to experience is a personality trait, and that often means we think of it as not changeable. And openness to experience is pretty stable in adulthood, and if anything, it tends to decline as people get older. But researchers have been looking at how and when personality does change, and drawing from their work, we might speculate that there could be ways to cultivate greater openness to experience. In particular, people's personality changes over adulthood are related to their social and occupational roles, and usually this is a good thing. Those roles tend to encourage us to become kinder, more agreeable, less neurotic, and more reliable and trustworthy. But those same roles may not do as good a job encouraging us to stay curious and interested in learning new things, because we get expert at what we're supposed to do in those roles. So one way to think about this is that you could attempt to build in the demands for new learning in your life in other ways, by trying to make learning new things a regular part of your leisure life. More broadly today, we've considered how individual interests foster learning and how this process is partly fueled by the fact that interests focus attention and learning and allow the development of initially greater knowledge, which then facilitates further learning and further interest. Now this section of our course has been focused on individual differences relevant to learning, the who is learning, and we've emphasized abilities and interests. In the next lecture, we'll consider the role of age as an individual difference which affects learning over the entire lifespan, in part through its impact on cognitive abilities and motivation.